Welcome to the award-winning Saints Happy Hour podcast. Seriously, this podcast has won awards. American standards are dropping every day. The show features Ralph, the best host in the world who can barely pronounce his own name, much less anyone else's. Marcus Colson, Colston, I mean, uh, Marcus Calloway. Dave is that dude who loves taking bathroom breaks. He's mad about almost anything, so make sure to lower your volume when he speaks. Put that freaking clown meme back up that I made. Jesus Christ. Andrew has sources, watches tapes, and knows football. He rarely shows up on time and wants to commit crimes to help the Saints win. Sean Payton would have done illegal things. Don't tell me I'm wrong, because you know it's true. Oh, and there's also Kevin, who is great at doing mock drafts, but struggles to actually watch Saints games or have a functioning relationship. Budrich wants to know how uh, the doctor's doing. That that ended. Anyway, grab a drink, sit back, and enjoy the insanity. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of Saints Happy Hour Podcast. As always, we are brought to you by Hard Hide Ponchatoula Strawberry Whiskey. All right, it's Saints Falcons Hate Week. So I had to bring on our pal from the Falcoholic, Dave Choate, uh, to discuss it all because I, I was talking to Dave before we before Thomas fired everything up and, and got everything running correct on video. And, and I think this is the most hilarious yet consequential Saints-Falcons regular season game maybe ever because you have these two sad teams, five and five, four and six, but there's so much at stake. But before we get to that, Dave, me and you, we talked in the summertime. And we were in the summer, we were both naive summer children. So who was more delusional? Me for believing in Pete Carmichael being a good offensive coordinator and the Saints offensive line being okay? Or you for believing Desmond Ritter could be like the 24th best quarterback in the Atlanta Falcons offense could still be competent? Who was a more naive summer child? Well, we still got seven games to go to see if Ritter can be that 24th best quarterback. So I'm going to say it's you for now because, uh, you know, that, that offensive line, man, you could, uh, you could drive a truck made of paper mache through that. It's really so. bad. It's really bad. You know, I was thinking about – I re-listened to our, our, our summer podcast, which it was, it's great, by the way. If, you want, if, if you're a Falcons fan listening to this or you're a Saints fan and you want to just listen to, like, delusional optimism from both ends and just laugh, you should check it out. Um, but I was thinking about this with the Falcons, and I think one thing that I, I missed and I think, like, a lot of smart people missed because, you know, Arthur Smith going into this year, people were like, oh, he is a – uh, he's a great, he's a great offensive mind, and, and Falcons have a running game. And if the, the Falcons' running game from last year, if, you, if it was, if it was a quarterback, it would be a top five quarterback. And offense is more stable than defense, and that's going to carry over. And I think one thing we missed is, unless you're Kyle Shanahan in San Francisco, offense carryovers from season to season because it's your quarterback, and. I don't exactly know why Atlanta's regressed, but by the anger I see on Falcoholic.com and other sites, is there a possibility that Arthur Smith just isn't really good at his job as far as being an offensive coordinator? I think it's one of those funny, funny things because you look at Tennessee when he was there, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe he just had the right confluence of guys. Right, but he he called a very effective red zone offense for like three seasons, um, and he came here, and that has not happened. So I I don't know if it's that he's not good as an offensive coordinator when he's a head coach, when he's got that additional stuff on his plate, whether it's again the quarterback um, and some of the other pieces. But it, I mean, it's a multifaceted problem. But we have seen him call jet sweeps for Jonu Smith in the red zone. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen him call Jonu Smith to to Michael Pruitt touchdown passes that didn't work. Like these are just little things, little examples. But there's a lot of stuff here that's not working, and ultimately that rolls right up to him, right? So at the end of the day, you now have two plus years, almost three years, to say maybe this this isn't really him unless he's got the exact circumstances he needs and he's a coordinator. He might just be a guy that tops out as a good coordinator. So, yeah, the other thing with the Falcons, I look at it and, and, and you've said, look, and you said in the summer too, and you've said it during the year, like the, the off season you guys had, it, it felt like it was successful. Your defense is, is a lot better. I feel, 
I feel like that's a pro- maybe a little bit of a product of your schedule, but whatever. Your schedule is your schedule. You're better yeah. on defense, right? Who cares who you play? Um, is there a sense, though, that as good as sort of Terry Fontenot has been in, in sort of the offseason and free agency maybe this year and last year even, that you drafted Kyle Pitts and you drafted Bijan, and maybe you should have taken Penny Sewell and taken Jalen Carter. Is there starting to be sort of, hey, y'all really whiffed on these top 10 picks? Is, there, is that sort of consensus starting to build? Because look, when the Saints, the Saints are losing too, we're, I can go chapter and verse on what they should have done in the draft and bad decisions they've made, Marcus too first and all of it. But is there sort of a sense of like the drafting hasn't been good enough, and that's kind of why – Part of the reason y'all are stuck in this, it's year three and you're not making the leap that you expected? Big time. And, and that conversation about Pitts, that happened more or less the moment he was drafted. You know, there were, you had your your three camps, you uh, four if you count, you know, trying to get Micah Parsons by any any means necessary. But <laughs> you had your, your Justin Fields camp. I was in that one. Um, you had your Sewell camp, which I still get random messages from people in that camp being like, you big idiot, even though I didn't advocate for pits, I'm still a big idiot. So it's fine. Um, and then, you, you know, you had the pits, you had, we're going to bet on the generational guy. And right away, you know, even though he had a thousand yard season, like didn't feel like they had gotten the most they could out of him. And then you're looking at it two years later and it, it doesn't even feel like they they know what they're doing with him, and then you pick Robinson. It's just, you know, I, I think that sense is definitely there, especially because you have to remember that Jalen Carter is a dog. So UGA fans are never, ever going to let this go. He was right there. He's as good as advertised. So that, that Robinson-Carter, you know, comparison is going to happen for the rest of their careers. So Yeah, and I feel like with Kyle Pitts, like, it's a usage issue maybe with Arthur Smith, but... He doesn't look the same to me athletically that he did as a rookie. He just doesn't look like a freak. And the thing is, when you draft a tight end, like top five, like he better be Gronk, right? Like if you draft a tackle or a defensive end or whoever, and they're just okay or they're pretty good, people will be like, okay, that's good. You need, you know. But left tackle is hard to get. Like, we got a decent one. We picked him top five. Maybe he's not all pro, but you, their left tackles are hard to find. A corner is hard to find. A, a pass rusher is hard to find. Like, tight end, it's, it's like almost like drafting a guard. Like, if you draft a guard, like, top 15, they better be, like, on a path to Canton or yeah. we're just going to rip them to shreds. And, and that, that pick, like, to me – I was like, thank you, Jesus, because I felt like Jamar Chase and all the others you, you guys missed on. Um, but this is the main thing that, I, that, that I've been thinking about. And I feel like Sunday is a fork in the road and a defining moment for both teams. Because the winner, I really feel like, say what you want about Tampa, I really feel like the winner of this game is going to have a ton of confidence and momentum, whether they deserve it or not. And I think the winner of this game is probably going to win the South. Ergo, the coach is not going to get fired because Atlanta is not going to fire the coach for how many years have y'all missed the playoffs? Five? Uh, this will be six if they don't make it. it yeah. So, like, if, if Arthur Smith gets y'all to the playoffs, even if you get your head kicked in by the Cowboys or whatever, like, they're not going to fire Arthur Smith. If he misses, if he misses the, if he gets him to the playoffs, right? So he's going to be your coach for probably another two, three years. He'll get to another chance to fix quarterback, and that'll be your path. It Same with Dennis Allen. Like the Saints aren't firing him if the Saints win the South, whether they get that they get beat, get beat five hundred to, to nothing by Cowboys in the playoffs. Like they're not going to fire a coach that wins a division title. The Saints just aren't doing that. But the loser, the wheels could come off. It would be four in a row losses for y'all. I think there's really potential for the Saints to wheels to come off because they play Detroit the next week. They're not beating them. So I really feel like this game is a really kind of like a fork in a road for both franchises. And it sounds so strange to have so much ex- at stake with a five and five team and a four and six team and a division title potentially at stake. But I really feel like these two franchises are going vastly different roads come Monday morning. Am I being overly dramatic or do you sense that as well, at least from the Falcons point of view? 
No, because the margins are so, so thin. Uh, I don't honestly know if they're going to fire Arthur Smith unless, again, the wheels come completely off. There's been reporting that, you know, they're planning to keep him next year. But the difference between winning this game, being back atop the division, being 3-0 and in the South, which the Falcons would be at that point, mm-hmm. having, a, having a path, and, and maybe Ritter looks pretty good. You know, mm-hmm. maybe you've got some hope, some things are coming together. And losing, where like you said, you've you've lost four in a row. You're basically out of it. You'd have to be perfect the rest of the way in the NFC South to win. Um, that that's it's huge. It's huge because this was supposed to be a pivotal season. They were supposed to be a contending team. They had a great free agency. You know, they had a decent at least draft class. Like all of this stuff was supposed to come together. It hasn't. Where do you go for that? You go to the quarterback. You go to the head coach. You know, you get a, a staff shakeup at least. You get a new quarterback. Like everything blows up with this loss, and, and I really do feel like it's not overstating it. And on the other hand, you know, I, you know, from my outside perspective, I feel like New Orleans is the team of diminishing returns. Right? Mm-hmm. You're you're going to keep pumping into this current roster. You can't. You got to spin your way out of the cap stuff each year. I know the cap is alive, but you do lose some players along the way. So if you fall apart here. You lose to the Falcons. You've only done that one time in the last, what, seven meetings. And you fall out of first in the South. You lose to the Lions next week. Are you even committed to, to Dennis Allen That's like right. that? Should you be? Yeah. You know? So, so it, it's it, it could be catastrophic. If it's really bad and lopsided, it could be for whatever team loses. It could be catastrophic. Yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing, you know, as much as the fan bases are frustrated with these two head coaches, the interesting thing I find is neither of the fan bases are like, stop calling plays. You know, Dennis Allen, he's been fine on defense. They struggle in the first half, fix it in the second half. That's annoying because that's been going on for most of the season. But even Arthur Smith, as much as the offensive struggle, I, I don't see people clamoring for him and maybe i'm just missing it i don't see people clamoring for him to be like hey author give up the play calling duties let somebody else do it i see him screaming at him don't run john o smith john o smith on a reverse don't do this don't do that how about you just give it to Bijan when it's first and goal from the four i see that but i haven't really been a clamor for him to like give up the play calling duties right like the frustration with author smith isn't i guess isn't that that would be a solution well, I think there's some of that there, but I also think it's not realistic because there's nobody else, and I think this is maybe deliberate, there's nobody else on staff that you would hand that to. You know, Dave Ragone, the offensive coordinator, has no play calling experience. Your mm-hmm. your tight end or your wide receivers coach is TJ Yates, a former quarterback. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he hasn't called plays. Justin Peel, the tight ends coach, I like a lot, hasn't called plays. Um, there's nobody here to hand it to, which I think is why it's maybe a little bit more muted. I think people want him to give it up, but there's really no alternative to doing that. And the guy that they lost this off season, Charles London, um, who I think is now with the dolphins and is their passing game coordinator. That would be the guy that would be the guy you'd hand it to. Mm -hmm. He left. They didn't replace him. They have no passing game coordinator. They don't even have a, a dedicated quarterbacks coach. Um, in this pivotal year. So I, I think there's a sense that like somehow Arthur Smith has put himself in this impossible position where he is solely responsible for this garbage, <laughs> but there's also nothing you can do unless you're going to fire him. So we just have to ride it out and hope for the best. So it's, I don't envy him being in that position, but he also put himself in that position. So coach better, what do your job. Easier That's what it's about. Fix. And this is, <laughs> Nice job. Uh, this, what's an easier thing to fix, Dave? The Falcons hemorrhaging turnovers or the Saints' inability to run the ball? I, like, part of me thinks it's the turnovers, but like with you guys, it just doesn't really stop the entire year. And some of the turnovers are flat out the most ridiculous things I've ever seen from a football team as far as just, I can't believe that just happened. It's hilarious because y'all are the Falcons, but it's incredible shit. These turn like these turnovers just do not stop for y'all. Yeah, I, I feel like it 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 should be the Falcons turnovers, right? Like this this is the story of the Falcons in 2023. You look at all of their problems, all of their problems, and you say, This is easy to fix. You know, you're not tackling. 
work on tackling. <laughs> you, you, you're, you're turning the ball over. Work on ball security. You got bad red zone play calling. Give it to your stud guys. All of these problems look easy to fix, and yet they fix none of them. So, you know, from any logical standpoint, the answer is, you know, the Saints offensive line scheme is not going to get better suddenly overnight. They're not going to start running the ball well. The Falcons could stop turning the ball over at any point. But if you throw logic out the window and you recognize this is the Atlanta Falcons, then you say there's no way they're going to get that cleaned up. So I don't have an easy answer for that one. You, you know, I, I look at Ritter and it wouldn't surprise me this week if he turned the ball over zero times and it wouldn't surprise me if he turned the ball over three times. I really don't know. <laughs> you sound like me. I have, I, have, I, have, I have no confidence about this game whatsoever. My only strong feeling, and we'll get to it in a little bit, my only strong feeling is I'll be shocked if with five minutes to go, it's not a one score game because that's just it's gonna be. That's just yeah. where you guys I mean, you guys have had like twenty nine out of forty two games for Arthur Smith or one score. I mean, that's this just is where happening. you live. That's Loop where the up. Saints live. <laughs> that's where that's where these two teams live in like the one score blender. Um yeah. so here's a here's a thing that that I had a podcast ask me, I think it was a couple of years ago and when I was a guest on there on on an Eagles podcast, and I really like this question. They said they said, they said to me, listen, uh, we don't watch the Saints every week. Um, what's something that's not obvious um, to a person that doesn't watch every play of the Falcons that drives Falcons fans crazy all year that isn't obvious, that isn't like, oh, we suck in the red zone. Oh, we turn the ball over time. Yeah, that's obvious. But what's something like when you watch this game, like the first two drives, that it, it'll be something that, I'll just be watching it and I'll just be drinking and I won't necessarily be paying attention. And you'll be like, Jesus with this again, yeah. Jesus with this again. Like what's a couple things that you, you that aren't obvious that drive you crazy during 2023. Yeah. I, I think one of them is the pass rush, because if you look at like, if you were to just go, you know, you're doing your preview, you're writing something up, you're talking, you're looking at the stats. You're like, Oh, Falcons pass rush is better this year. They got more sacks, more pressures. It never shows up at the right time. <laughs> when you need the Falcons to get pressure, when you need them to get a sack, they cannot do it. Last week against, or two weeks ago, against Arizona, Kyler Murray is scrambling this way, scrambling that. Arnold Ebicady has him contained, somehow loses it. You know, a couple guys miss tackles. All of a sudden, Murray runs 30 yards down the field, and the game is over. Like, it, whenever they need to get that, they cannot do it. And that problem got instantly worse as soon as they lost Grady Jarrett for the year because he had never been hurt before. This is the the rock-solid guy for the Falcons' defense, and you don't realize just how good he is until he's gone and you see what life is like without him. And, like, the pass rush evaporated overnight, basically. They got Josh Dobbs a few times because Josh Dobbs ran forward into pressure, <laughs> you know, which is... Not ideal, but it, 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 that is the biggest thing. And the other big thing for me is like, I end up yelling about wasting early downs because this offensive line really, you know, pedigreed, highly paid offensive line, they're not blocking as well as they were a year ago. Um, the tight ends and wide receivers are struggling a little bit in that regard too. And there are just way too many early downs where they're like, well, let's see what happens if we uh, run Tyler Algier right into the teeth of the defense, and he makes it nowhere. He's hit in the backfield instantly. I think he and Damian Pierce have the two lowest yards before contact averages in the NFL. And yet we're still doing it because it's mm -hmm. like, well, you got to establish the run. Do you have to establish the run in a way that doesn't work? <laughs> no, you don't. So those are two things. You will see You will see a, a second and nine all year run up the middle on the first two drives. It will not work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get mad about it. You will see Derek Carr drifting in his Derek Carr way across the field with five seconds. It's not going to work. I, I'm going to be pissed about both. Yeah, the Saints. It it, it it's it, it's sort of semi obvious things is is they are top five in penalties, and they have the dumbest like formation penalties you'll ever see. Like last, last two weeks ago, Minnesota, Jameis is in, throws a beautiful ball to Olave. It's going to be first and ten. The stadium's getting nervous. It's going to be first and ten at like the Falcon at the Minnesota like thirty nine. Rashid Shahid lined up. Dave, I kid you not, like two yards off sides. And it's just <laughs> like they, they they threw the flag and we're like, oh, that's Minnesota. That's that's offsides. That's offsides on Minnesota. No, no, no. 
soft sides on the Saints receiver for lining up wrong when you can literally tell you can literally ask the referee am I good do I need to move up do I need to move back no no he just lined up like two yards offside that and you mentioned the tackling issue I have a theory that the Saints defense is old and the Falcons defense is old and the longer you go into the year you get banged up you get a little slower you get a little sore and your tackling just gets just a little bit worse each week. And I think with the Saints, you're starting to see a little bit of I mean, they they're they're they got Honey Badger who had some moments early, but he's old and A is old. Like they're, they're you know, Demario Davis, he's kind of lost a step. Like they're just not and Pete Werner, I don't know what the hell's happened to him in coverage, you know. Um, but that's something for the Saints. So we kind of talked about it earlier, but and you mentioned it. The you feel like Arthur Smith, he's only coaching for his job. His job only becomes in jeopardy Sunday if, like, we are la- Saints Twitter is pointing and laughing at you middle of the fourth quarter because the Falcons are getting housed. Any other way, like his job, you don't feel like it's in jeopardy yet. It's, it'll, it would take something really ugly Sunday for Arthur Smith to be, to, for him, his seat to become really hot. Yeah, I, I think, you know, and again, I'm going off of the reporting here. Um, it's Jeff Schultz at The Athletic. Um, he He's pretty plugged in to, to you know, the, the front office here. I feel like he's got a good read on, you know, how hot that seat is or should be. And, you know, he left the door open, like, if it's, if it's really bad. And I think that, a, like, a, you know, God help me for even saying this out loud. If they lose by, like, 20 points on Sunday to the Saints— Post by, you know, post, we got to fix this thing, you know, fourth straight loss. I think that at least opens that door a little bit. They're not going to fire him after this week, but at the end of the season, does it prompt you to say if this team is, you know, God, I don't even know, five and 12, let's say, like if they really screw this up uh, the rest of the way and they just fall apart. um, I don't know if he actually survives that. And I think that starts with the Saints game. Any other outcome, you know, a win, obviously, hooray, that's what I want. <laughs> um, but a close, a close loss, you know, I, I don't, I don't think it necessarily turns up the heat. It's something where, for whatever reason, um, Arthur Blank has decided that you know Smith is is his guy, and he needs more than this year. Um, so you know, <laughs> I, I, I get the sense that he he looks at the same problems that I'm seeing from a different way, from like, a, oh, we just got to fix this thing. It just needs more time. We just need to get this established. Whereas I look at it as a 30-plus year fan of the Atlanta Falcons and say, this is going to continue to go wrong in exactly this way because it always does, right? Like, there's yeah. there's no logic behind that. You can't. I know you can't make business decisions that way, but it's, yeah. I, I actually, th- this is a, a tangent, but people were incredulous with me when they played the Bucks, and thankfully they didn't lose. But they were in the red zone. It was third down. You know, the clock was ticking. They were going to run out of time if they completed a pass short of the end zone. And I said, maybe kick the field goal here. And people were like, it's third down. What are you talking about? Which is, (laughs) it's a ridiculous thing to suggest. And I know that. But what happened? Desmond Ritter threw an interception. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, I knew that the like the least likely outcome of that red zone trip was a yeah. touchdown. And like, so, yeah, here, you know, I have you scars. just know I have yeah. scars. I have I have Atlanta Falcon scars all over my body. Trust me, young children. I know of what I speak. Yeah. The interesting thing with I, I think Saints fans is there is a large chunk on not in so much in real life, I don't know, but but on social media, there is a huge chunk of Saints fans that are like, I don't want to win the South. I don't care. I want everyone fired. I want to lose out. I want Dennis Allen fired. I'm tired of this. I want to reset everything. And that's a big chunk. And we're, we're Saints fans, we argue back and forth. I'm like, I'm not, I'm like, I'm not losing to the Falcons for any promise of some grand mystery box of a future. I'm like, screw that, beat the Falcons. And we argue over it. Is there a sense from the Falcons, is there a, 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 a portion of Falcons fans that are like, you know what, maybe we just need to lose and not win the South 
and get ourselves one of these six or seven young, good quarterbacks that we watch on Saturday. Jaden Daniels, LSU, Penix, Bo Nix, whoever. And they're like, you know what? I don't want to win the South. I'm not, Just lose. Get me a quarterback. We'll be better off in the long term. We'll stomach it for this year. Is, that a, is there a chunk of Falcons fans that want that? Or is it still mostly, fuck the Saints, beat the Saints, worry about that come January? Yeah, I, I think I think the Saints are the exception most of the time. They're, but you know, like no, there are very few Falcons fans who are going to be like, I don't care if we lose to the Saints. Like there, that is sort of the the golden rule. However, those people do exist, and I think that a larger chunk of the fan base is ready to to not win the South and lose. In but to me, this is a tricky one because there, there's two factors, right? The first is you wanted that in 2020 once they fired Dan mm-hmm. Quinn, which was totally understandable. And they got the fourth overall pick and they took Kyle Pitts. So you see that like even going and I know that people were like they should have had the first pick. And then that that changes things maybe. But, you, you, you know, they've had three top 10 picks. It hasn't been franchise altering. It's about who you have making the decisions. It's about mm-hmm. the coach that you ultimately hire. There are a lot of reasons not to say, let's just keep spinning the roulette wheel the way the Panthers are about to do. So, you know, they're they're dead and gone. We can we laugh at the Panthers? Can we laugh at the Panthers for a second? Oh, we can laugh at the Panthers. My God. The Panthers, Dave, they were up 21 to 7 against Tampa in week, what was it, 17. Up 21 to 7. And they were like, I was like, oh my God, they're gonna beat. Tampa, they're going to come to New Orleans. The Saints just beat the Eagles. It's going to be Saints, Panthers, and like tiebreakers and all this, like depending on what happens, like could be for the South. Like they might flex that shit to Sunday night, which would be hilarious. And listen, it all fell apart. Tom Brady made one of those stupid comebacks that he did last year. He did it against the Saints. He even had one against y'all where they had a stupid pass, uh, stupid rough in the passer penalty, I think, and, and he yep. ended up beating y'all. So, like, that happened. They fire Wilkes, who had them playing really well, running the ball, right, playing really good. They fired him. They hired Frank Reich. They didn't draft Stroud. They drafted a midget. And now they're the worst team in the NFL. Like, it's just it's just glorious because I I, lo- I I love it. It's 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 fantastic. It's it's just this division. Like you look at the future of every team in this division, and where is Tampa Bay going? You know, unless they end up with a top ten pick, which I'm not mm-hmm. sure they will after all this. Where are the Saints going? Where are the Falcons going? Where are the Panthers? Like none of these teams have an easy like. I'm going to be good next right. year answer like they just don't and this division sucks so it's <laughs> it's hard to believe but you know going back to what i was saying before with the with the panthers you don't want to be the panthers um but the other piece of that is too is like if the owner is pretty committed to not firing arthur smith you know I, the draft pick argument i get i want a quarterback too but you know are you going to suffer for the next 7 weeks and then still have the same head coach is that worth it? Like, I, you know, is it worth losing to the Saints especially? That's what I would That's challenge right. people to answer. And the answer to that is always no. A couple more things before we get out of here and you, we predict the game. First thing is the mood in the, in the stadium. I've heard from somebody that I know in Atlanta, he's connected to the Falcons, and he's like, there is a real sense from the Falcons, people, that there's going to be an excess number of Saints fans in the Georgia Dome. And I can tell you my example to this, in two weeks, Dave, the Superdome is going to be blue with Lions fans. Because Lion fans, yeah. this is the season of their dreams. They have people that, if you're 60 years, if you're under the age of 60, you ain't seen this shit for the Lions. And I see it. The Lions travel everywhere. And they're buying up tickets in the Dome over face value in the terrace. Like, it's going to be blue. So my question to you is, is my little source with the Falcons, is there a sense that this stadium is not only going to be packed with Saints fans, but you're going to have a fan base that's going to this game not really happy and will be quick to turn on the Falcons if it doesn't start out well? Yeah, I mean, I think the first part, yes. This is... 
when things are going well or things are going even moderately well falcons fans show up like i think the reputation is not earned but when things are going badly you know those tickets get sold to somebody else this you know the opposing fan base starts to show up it's a little quieter like all of those things have historically been true and it's especially hard to tell falcons fans you know Stick with us after five straight years of this, <laughs> turning into the year that was supposed to be different and is now the sixth straight year of this. So, like, I, I highly suspect that both of those things will probably be true. The best thing the Falcons can do is take the opening kickoff, which they don't usually do, and score and get the crowd into it. Because barring that, it's going to be a, a kind of a graveyard in there. And, and again, like, is that, you know... A, <laughs> Should that be used against the fan base after the last five or six years? I don't know about that. I really don't. You know, um, Saints fans are Saints fans. And you guys, you're like migratory bird, birds, you know. <laughs> you nice fly story. in, you, you stink up the place. I'm sorry. No. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it, it, it's interesting Solve your to problems me because with aggression. <laughs> it, 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 this game is also interesting. When I, looked at, when I look at Ritter, you know, it's like you say, I, I, he struggles a lot and he has a lot of bad turnovers. But then I see it and I'm like, eh, he's not so bad. He's not as physically gifted as his RAS score says he should be. But what does he have to do to, for the Falcons to believe in him in 2024 and not cast him aside and be, in, and be hey, we're going Tannehill, we're going Cousins, we're drafting a guy, whatever. What does he have to do these last seven weeks? Like, what, what is it? What does he have to do to solidify himself as the starter or even really keep himself in the mix for the job in 2024? Yeah. Well, the first thing is, God, not Tannehill. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's a, that, that is a guy that is less welcome than Saints fans in that stadium because, I, I, you know, Ryan Tannehill three to five years ago, absolutely give me that guy. That's he's, not this Ryan Tannehill. He's completely um, cooked. Completely cooked. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think he has to excel. I, I, I think he's got to be really good. And I, I think I wrote this the other day on the site. Like, he cannot just be decent and keep this job next year, roll into it as the favorite. Like, none of that is going to fly. They cannot afford to do that. So he's going to be excellent. He's got to be the best version of himself. He's got to cut down on the turnovers, which I think just kind of naturally happens because that still feels like an unsustainable rate, you know. Um, I was looking at this the other day. I think the Falcons have either the worst or the second worst um, percentage of fumbles that have been lost, right? So they've even been unlucky. Yeah. They're turning, you know, they're giving those opportunities to other defenses, but they're also just losing them. But he's got to cut down on the turnovers. He's got to sharpen up as a passer. And he's got to continue to show growth as a runner because. If he hadn't fumbled against Tampa Bay, he'd have five rushing touchdowns on the year, and he's actually pretty deadly in the red zone. Those runs, those keepers have been terrific. So, you know, the the whole package with him, you know, I know pre-draft there were a lot of national analysts who were excited about him because he can do a little bit of everything well. The problem for him is he has notably done like two or three things really poorly this year. So you get that cleaned up, you play at the level Maybe you feel he's capable of playing because they did bet on him this year, big time. You know, they did not bring in an alternative. Um, that probably keeps him in the mix for next year. But, I mean, after the, the first, you know, eight weeks of the season, after being benched briefly and so forth, like, that, that's a big ask. I, I'm not expecting it. I'd love to see it. I'm not expecting it. Yeah, so before we get uh, the, the prediction on who won the South, I want to talk about this game. And, and I, if I said to you, Dave, I'm going to give you $1,000. I'm not going to tell you the score, and I'm not going to tell you turnovers because the score or turnovers, you could bet on who would win. And the turnovers really tell a story, right? If, if, if I tell you Atlanta's turned the ball over twice and the Saints are turning the ball over none, you'd be like, oh, crap, we're really screwed because the st statistics just say that, right? But what one stat, if I hand you the score sheet and you could look at the stat, the stat sheet at like 11 in the morning, Sunday morning, what stat sheet must the Falcons do well in for them to for you to feel confident that they're going to win this game? Well, if you take away turnovers, because that is the obvious one, um, you know, I would say 
I would feel good about this game if I saw something like 150, 200 rushing yards. And mm-hmm. the reason for that being, we know it's going to be a close game. Yeah. And if they're able to run that much and that well, it tells you that they're in it, and it tells you that they're playing to their strengths. So if I looked at that, you know, in the absence of any other information, you know, I'd assume that they have a pretty good chance of winning. Now, admittedly, they just did that against Arizona, and they lost, but that was a defensive breakdown at the end. They were close. Things were a little bit better. So to me, that's probably the thing you're looking at. I'd love to say passing yards because <laughs> or passing touchdowns like because that would be a good bellwether but you could have you know three turnovers with that so i mean I, it's you know it's crazy to me i look back at the game last year with Ritter, it's crazy to me that that y'all ran for 231 yards and didn't win like it's just like looking at that i was like how did that not happen but but ritter it was his first start he was he was objectively terrible the one thing that i'm gonna look for in this game like tell me how many touches Falcon Killer Taysom Hill gets? Like oh, to, to me, if if he is not heavily involved in this game, Dave, I might camp out at Airline Drive and accost P. Carmichael myself. Like to me, I know the Saints, they try to manage his touches because he's 33, 34, and they're like, hey, we got to get him through the year. We did it last year. We managed his touches. He got through the year healthy, and that's part of the reason why he was successful. And I think there's merit to that. I really do. But for Sunday, like to me, for the Saints, for Atlanta, like this is kitchen sink game. Like if it takes 20 Taysom Hill carries and three passes and like he's got to get a ton of touches and goal line touches and whatever. And like that's what it takes. Like that's what it takes. So like that's the thing I'm going to look for in the score sheet. Like because here's the thing. If Taysom Hill is prominently involved it means the Saints are likely getting to the red zone because at least they've figured out the Saints that when we get to the red zone, the one thing we know that really works is Taysom. And I think his use sort of dropped down against Minnesota because Jameis hit a couple of miracle throws. They fell behind, so they gave up running the ball. That's why his touches drop. But if his touches are high, it means the Saints are moving the ball, having sustained success. So that's my thing. You, your thing was was running. My thing is to uh, Taysom Hill, uh, he, he, he's one more great performance against you guys from maybe getting a statue. Like he is, he is an icon, like him, Cam Jordan, like he is an iconic Falcon, like killer. I mean, if you just play his tape of playing quarterback against you guys, you might think he's a competent NFL quarterback the way he it's. I, I I will never understand it. I, I love seeing every fan base that plays you guys like win or lose. There's always that moment where Taysom Hill does something and it's like, why didn't the defense see that coming? And it's been years of this. Like every time he's in a game, everybody fucks up well, for some he's, reason. He's the, he's, he is the perfect wildcat quarterback because the wildcat, when the dolphins invented it, they had Ronnie Brown running and most of the teams that ran it, the quarterback couldn't throw. Taysom Hill can throw just good enough to where, like, if he tricks you and the dude's wide open, he'll hit it. And, and that's what makes it great. And, like, he better be prominently involved in this game where I'm just going to lose. I'm going to lose. Like, you'll do, you, can just, you can just go and, like, retweet me if, if I'm in a I'm in rage spiral. It'll just be, where's Taysom? Where's Taysom? You can retweet it to all the Falcon. I really hope I'm doing that. No offense. So <laughs> Well, I'll be yeah. retweeting. I'll be reading, tweeting your stuff if, if, if it goes bad for y'all. So, fair. Yeah, point. that's fair. Um, that's fair. Who's going to win the South, Dave? Who, who, two questions. When we get to week 17, or I guess week 18, is it going to be a steel cage death match between Saints Falcons to win the South? My second, second part, who in the end is going to win the South and get the joy of hosting a playoff game probably Saturday at like 3 o'clock? Um, I, I'm going to say, yes, it's a death match at the end of the season. That just feels right. <laughs> I think the only outcome where that doesn't happen is a Falcons death spiral, which is on the table, to be clear. It's on the table. But uh, I, I think that the Falcons, God help me, um, I think despite everything, they're still going to win the South. I, I, I think they're going to put this thing together, and it's going to fool people, including 
you know, people who should not be fooled in this organization <laughs> into thinking they're this close. I, I just, it feels right to me. It feels like 2019 all over again, where for some reason they were great in the second half of the season and Dan Quinn managed to not get himself fired. And then the next year was a disaster. Maybe the next year isn't a disaster, but it feels like that kind of season, except the South is so bad that they should make the playoffs. So I, you know, it it's going to come down to a game in your stadium at the end of the year. I don't love that, but uh, are it's... you? I'm not. I don't know if I'm emotionally ready for that. Like, <laughs> like because here's the here's the thing. Like the Falcons and the Saints. For as much as we hate each other, and we do, Dave. We hate each other. Oh, we God, we care about this game. We don't even care that the national media ignores it. We're like, we don't care. Stay out of our business. This is me. This is us. Get out of here. But when you look at like games the Saints and Falcons have played that have mattered, like really mattered, like you can look at it like probably like 2010 when y'all got home field and Hartley, you know, Hartley misses a field goal late. That one mattered. The playoff game. I think they had one where the, the Carolina ended up winning the South at seven, eight, and one in what was it, 2014? We played yeah. y'all in like second to last week. That was a big game. Um, the guy for the Giants, Usum, uh, what was his name? Usi, he had an interception and ran it back for a touchdown. But, like, there ain't many games that, like, have stakes. It's only, like, I just want to beat the Falcons because I hate them. Like, we don't have many of these big, huge games that matter a lot, like like Sunday, like potentially end of the season. I don't know if I'm emotionally ready for it. Are you emotionally ready for it? Oh, absolutely not. I'm I'm barely emotionally ready for like the Jets game in two weeks and Tim Boyle. Like I, oh you 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 know there are. It, this is how bad this is. Like there are Falcons fans who are legitimately like, oh God, Tim Boyle is going to come on the field and kick our asses. Like we have been in some dark places, man. So no, I'm not emotionally ready for any of it. I'm I'm just gonna do my best. Well, Dave, thanks for joining us. Guys, you can find him, the Falcoholic. Find him on social media. Find him on Twitter. They write great stuff. And, and I'm telling you, if me and Dave, if Dave and me are, are kind of correct and the, the Saints are going to have this steel cage death match at the end of the year, you want to follow the Falcoholic. You want to know what's going on with them the, la- the next four, five, six weeks before that game. Injuries, analysis, they have it all. They do a great job. Uh, Dave, thanks for joining us. And have a safe and happy uh, Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. Find us and like us wherever you get your podcast. And remember, live show December 8th. Click the link in the description. Still some tickets left. Thanks for Thomas running the show back in Poland. I'm Ralph Marlborough. Until next time, the bar is closed.